This is the 17th lecture for MA 1012 at University College Cork. In this lecture, we're going to look at elementary matrices and at the LU factorization of matrices. An elementary matrix is one which we obtain by starting with the identity matrix and then applying a single row operation to produce some new matrix. Uh, so let's see what happens if we try that in a simple example. If we start off with the 3x3 three three identity matrix, and if we carry out one row operation, for example, let's swap row 2 and row 3. I guess the notation I've been using is something like this. Uh, the notation in the next row notes would be row 2 swaps with row 3. Um, so what, uh, what happens? Uh, the resulting matrix looks like this. It's not very uh, interesting or complicated. Uh, you just swap row 2 and row 3 and you get this guy. Uh, this is an elementary matrix, sometimes called something like E for elementary. But after all, there's many different elementary matrices because there's many different choices you could make for the row operation. Another example would be if we start with the 3x3 three three identity matrix again, um, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And if we were instead to multiply a row 2 by minus 3, minus 3 times row 2, so uh, row 2 times minus 3, mod scaled by minus 3, and we get some new matrix, which is just exactly the same matrix as before, except that we've scaled row 2 by minus 3. So that's another elementary matrix, often called something like E. Um, Okay, so that's how we can carry out these calculations of elementary matrices. But what do they do? What's the point of them? When we use one of these elementary matrices and we do something with it, uh, it we apply it to another matrix, it does a row operation. Let's find it, let's start with this example here. If we take that example, that example was obtained by um, that example is obtained by swapping rows 2 and 3 of the identity matrix. What happens if we apply it? Let's just apply it to an arbitrary single column. If it applied to several columns, it applies to each column individually, at a, one at a time. So we might as well just see what it does to one single column. Because what it does to a matrix with many columns is what it does to each column at one at a time. So we compute that out 1, 0, 0 times x1, x2, x3. So 1, x1, and nothing of anything else. So you just get x1. Uh, no x1s, no x2s, and an x3. No x1s, 1x2, no x3s. So an x2. And note what that does. That has, in effect, swapped. It's taken these guys and it swapped them. So the effect of multiplying by this matrix is to swap rows 2 and 3. So if we start with the identity matrix and apply one single row operation to it to give a, a matrix E, then E times A is A with that single row operation applied to it. So that's what happens when you take this matrix E and multiply by it. And of course the proof of that would be fairly involved. Now if we have a single row operation we can always reverse it. Every one of our row operations was invertible. We could scale by some, a row by some number and rescale it by the reciprocal of that number. As long as the number is not zero and that's all we're allowed to scale by then, then that works fine. Or we could add a multiple of a row to another row, or then we could subtract it again. So those row operations are always invertible. And so, as a consequence, these matrices E are always invertible. For any single row operation that we apply, we always get an invertible matrix. So we start with the, with, with the identity matrix, we apply one row operation to it, we get a matrix we call E. That's always invertible. And E A is A with that row operation applied. And so, uh, therefore, E inverse A must be A with the inverse operation applied. 
Okay, so that's the, the result of, of hitting the thing backwards with an E inverse. They must all be invertible, and you must you know, get invert E by starting with the identity and doing the inverse row operation to get E inverse, and that's what re E inverse does to a matrix A. Now how do we apply this idea? Um, we know that if we had a, a matrix um, A and it was invertible, if A is invertible, we said that if we put A and the identity matrix in beside one another in this augmented matrix with a whole bunch of columns here, not just a single constants column, but all these columns of the identity matrix sitting here, and we went through the process of the ro of reduced row echelon form, we ended up at the identity matrix in A inverse. But each step was a row operation. So um, there are various row operations involved. And so each is some uh, is associated with some matrix E, let's say E1, E2, dot, 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 E something or other, some number of E matrices. So each row operation is carried out by such a matrix. So as we've said, if you start with the identity matrix and you apply one row operation to it, you get something which we usually call E. Uh, in each stage in this process, we're doing a different row operation. So each time we do that, we get a different E. So E1, E2, and so on are the various E matrices that arise by taking those row operations that we applied here and for each single one of them, constructing the associated E elementary matrix. But what we must have done then is to, is to take this original matrix and multiply it each time by one of these E's. So what we've done is we started with this matrix A and the identity, and then the next step in the elimination process was to multiply by some matrix E, some E1, given by the first, carrying out the first elementary row operation on the identity, gives us this E, and it carries out that operation on this guy. The next step must be you multiply by some E2 matrix given by the next row operation applied to the identity, and so on and so forth. So if you keep going and going and going and going, eventually you've applied all these different row operations, oops, um, E, let's say, 2, E, 1, whole sequence of them, E1, E2, da 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 E, M, all applied to A and the identity, and the result must be the, row of the reduced row echelon form, because each step of row echelon form is computed by multiplying by one of these E matrices. And so when you're done, you must get the identity and A inverse. But what have you done? You've just multiplied by these things together. So what you've discovered, first of all, is that EM dot 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 E2, E1 times this guy must be this guy, and times this guy must be this guy. So E1 A must be the identity. And, so that's the first slot. And then if we look at the second slot, we get that E1, EM dot 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 E1 times the identity is A inverse. So we found a way to compute out by these row operations uh, an expression for how we would write the inverse. The inverse is the product of all of those elementary matrices, each of which can generate one step in the row um, in the reduced row echelon um, calculation. We did a reduced row echelon calculation starting with A and identity matrix. That's our augmented matrix. We put A here and the identity here. In other words, the columns of A go in here, the columns of the identity go in here. Every step of the way when we do um, our reduced row echelon operations, all of our Gaussian elimination, at every single step we applied a matrix E1, E2, and so on, multiplied by some matrix. And so the product of those matrices must multiply by, by A to give the identity, and in fact must be the inverse matrix of A. So this gives us yet another um, reason to, to think about um, how inverse matrices are related to these steps. In fact, it makes clear um, that we can now prove the remaining parts of our theorem the pre previous time about how inverses are related to um, inverse matrices are related to row operations and to uh, reduced row echelon form. So I won't go back and state that again. We had a long theorem about how inverses work. And this finishes that theorem off. Let's see it done in a simple example when we do all the steps out of the of the echelon form. Um, so we'll start off with a matrix um, B. It's just going to be 2, 4, 3, 7. It's a very simple matrix. And we already know how to, how to invert uh, 2 by 2s anyway, so it's not a really a worthwhile example. But still, it'll, it'll show us the steps we need to take. So we start off with this guy. 
and then the first step I want to take is to um, uh, is to try and get the pivot to kill what's underneath it. So um, let's uh, well let's actually do a, a simpler step following the notes. Um, they've done it somewhat differently than what we've said in the in the lectures. But uh, so let's follow the notes. The notes suggest to simplify the matrix by simply um, subtracting this guy from this guy. Minus one, that'll make this into a one, which is somewhat simpler. So the first row doesn't change, and the second row becomes one, uh, and then f uh, three because we subtract the first row from the second. Um, and now what we'll do is we'll take um, uh, we'll take twice this guy from this one, uh, and we get uh, this guy. The second row stays the same. First row is minus that to that is zero. Minus that to that is one. Okay, sorry. Minus that to that is oh, I've got I got a mistake in the no oh, minus two. Sorry, minus minus two minus the uh, minus two times three is six is uh, minus two. Okay, there we are. All right. So um, so now what we can do is we can scale the first row. Um, we'll scale this row by minus a half, uh, giving us um, zero one one three. And then we can add um, minus three this to this, giving us um, zero one one zero. And then finally, we can uh, swap these two and get um, one zero zero one. Now that's the the process of the Gauss elimination carried out all the way from beginning to end. We started with this two by two matrix, and we ended up with the identity. Okay, now what we have to do is think about how would we write this guy as a product of these elementary matrices. So how do we do that? Well, we go back and look at the steps that we carried out. Minus one, uh, minus one first row to second row, when applied to the identity, um, gives one, uh, zero, uh, minus one of this to here. It gives me minus one, one. Um, so that's uh, that's the elementary matrix that does this operation. The elementary matrix that does this operation, minus 2 that to that, you start with the identity matrix and then you take minus 2 of this to this, so it's 1, minus 2, 0, 1. So take the identity and then apply minus 2 that row to that row and get this guy. So this is my one of my E matrices, this is another E matrix, an elementary matrix. The elementary matrix for this operation is minus a half of the first row, so minus a half, the first row in the identity matrix. The elementary operation of this guy, minus three, this to this, so um, one, zero, minus three, one. Then the swapping of the rows is given by taking the identity matrix and swapping rows. And that should give us our various elementary matrices. So we know that if we multiply them out in that order, um, writing them down in the order in which they appeared here, uh, we should, uh, going this way, in the order in which they appeared, we should get um, an expression for the inverse matrix. So I'm just writing these out this way. And this guy here. So that's carrying out. That's that what would carry out these operations, and they'd apply to B and end up at the identity. So we started with B and went to the identity matrix by this series of operations. Each of these operations is carried out by these matrices because you take that operation applied to the identity to get that matrix. That one applied to the identity gives you that. That one applied to the identity gives you that. And so we've got the sequence of matrices, which are uh, which are computing out these steps that take us from B to the identity. And so when applied to B, they must give the identity. In other words, they must compute out. B inverse. So B inverse must be this guy. So it follows in, uh, uh, by um, the same story that B must be, well, the same matrices, but with their inverse is written in the opposite order. So I'd have to write the inverse of this guy over here, which is uh, the same thing, and I'd have to write the inverse of this guy over here. It subtracts uh, one row from another, so I have to add one row to the other to get it, its inverse. Uh, one. one. So, so if this guy is supposed to subtract um, a one row from another, this one has to add it back again. And so uh, this one was to subtract um, 
this one was to was to subtract twice uh, row two from row one, and so its inverse should add to get it done done again. This guy scaled by minus a half, so to to un, in, undo it, we scale by minus two, the reciprocal minus a half. This guy subtracted three of one row from another, so to reverse it, I need to add the three uh, back again. And so you can see the operations carried out here step by step that carry out a calculation of how to write B as a product of these elementary matrices. So these are elementary matrices which compute out B inverse, and they're given by the steps in the Gaussian elimination. And then these are their inverses put in the opposite order. We go this way. So here we went and did the various matrices that carry out the steps to turn B into the identity. And these are the steps put in reverse order that tear the identity to B, and so they compute out B. A special case, which actually occurs quite quite frequently, um, is that maybe there are no no row swaps. Row swaps make everything more complicated, but if there are no row swaps, then we get something very special happening. Because then what we find is that when we do our processing, the first step, when we take our pivot, if, it, if there's no row swap, that means the pivot must have worked out perfectly fine, whatever it was, some number here. It has to be something non-zero. And then in the process, uh, the next step, it has to be non-zero because we, uh, we otherwise we would swap something in place to replace it. And then it has to be the case that it hits everybody under it and kills them all. And so they all become zeros and so on. And so we move down and down. And so what we find is that um, if there are no row swaps, then our, our pivots successfully kill everything under them. And they never need to be swapped in place with anything. But the process is then a one of, of the pivot wiping out the things underneath it first, killing the things underneath it. And we go successfully through pivots. And then we go back up again. And the last pivot kills everything above it. Um, so we end up with some final pivot somewhere down here. And then it manages to kill everything, obviously, above it and um, by some operations that go and add row, multiples of rows to higher rows. And then we go back up. So we imagine going down this way, each step, each pivot killing everything under it, under it, under it, under it, under it, succeeding to, to do its job. And then go back again, each pivot killing everything above it, above it, above it, above it. And so what we end up with is an expression of this guy as um, the killing of things underneath is carried out by a lower, lower, a lower uh, triangular matrix. Why lower? Because you take the identity matrix and you uh, you carry out this operation on the identity matrix, you'll add something to something underneath and it's produced something lower triangular. So they're all lower up to some point. And then after that, they become upper because you're adding things to higher things. You get upper, 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 upper. So some number of lower and some number of upper guys. Um, so that'll compute out the inverse of the matrix. So we said you compute out the inverse by just putting these things together in the order, these elementary matrices in the order uh, in which they appear going this way. And that's what we've done here. But that means if we reverse the process, we get A is uh, expressed as uh, a lower inverse, a lower inverse, da -da -da, lower inverse, a whole bunch of lowers, uh, and then upper triangular inverse, da -da -da, upper triangular inverse, a whole bunch of upper triangulars. The inverse of a lower triangular is lower triangular, the inverse of an upper triangular is upper triangular. And so we get uh, an expression uh, that's called an LU factorization or LU decomposition. Um, an LU factorization is uh, an expression, LU factorization means that we write in a matrix as L times U. And if there are no row swaps, which is often the case uh, in uh, the uh, row echelon, you only have to worry about the row echelon, the reduced row echelon that never generates any row swaps at the the next steps, they never generate row swaps. Um, once the pivots are successfully in place from going downwards, down, 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 adding things to lower things and so on, then going back up again is no problem. We never have to swap because they're already in place, the pivots. So if there are no row swaps in row echelon um, calculation, calculation, um, then uh, A is L U, uh, and that's from the elementary matrices. really from their inverses written in the appropriate order. Let's do an example of computing it all out um, in detail with a, 
a serious size of matrix and get all the all the lower and upper stuff organized. So let's take a matrix. Um, say A is uh, one minus one minus five two zero one four two minus two um, one zero zero three minus one four one zero and then we'll try to understand how to use this uh, this approach to compute the solutions to ax equals b and again x is the unknown here um, for b equal to uh, 0 1 minus 2 2 so uh, there's our a and our b and then we have to find the x so the way we're going to organize this is to think about it as an LU decomposition problem if we try and write this LU factorization for a it should speed up the process of finding the answer and it'll turn out if in this lucky case that we don't need row swaps to do it so what we do is we start off with the matrix a um, so I'll just rewrite it all out here and what we need to do is to get this pivot to kill everything underneath it and so the pivot will have to have um, one of this uh, first row added to the second row and we'll have to add five of the first row to the third row and we'll have to add minus two of the first row to the um, to the to the third to the fourth row, um, so that means um, we get as a result a matrix coming out looking like first row is unchanged, and then the second row is zero one one three, third row is zero four five minus four. And the fourth row zero minus two, one two. Okay, now uh, that pivot is again. We can draw the little pivot boxes if we like, and you don't need to draw them if you don't like to. That pivot's killed everything under it. Removed down. We can do pivot, and we see we don't need to to swap rows because the pivot so far at least because the pivots are non-zero, so they don't need to swap any other pivot in place. They haven't failed and had to be replaced by swapped pivots. So there's no no swaps so far. This pivot has to kill the things underneath it. So this row, I'll add minus four of it to this row, and then I'll add um, two of it to this row. So that way, the one kills the four by having minus four row, the two added to row three, and then two of row two added to row four. So that's um, how I'll compute out uh, what makes this pivot kill the things underneath it. So first row unchanged second row unchanged third row is now going to become um, if I've got it right it's 0 0 1 minus 16 that's minus 4 this to this is 0 minus 4 that's that is 1 minus 4 minus minus 4 times 3 is minus 12 at minus, minus 16 and then one more row I'm quite enough room here for another row okay so 0 um, 0, 3, 8, I think, right, because we've got, that's nothing there. Okay, so uh, my, uh, so it's plus 2 of this to this, plus 2 of that to that, plus 2 of this is 6, to add to that is 8. Okay, so there's the result so far, and, um, and now we begin to see that we're very close to getting um, our diagonal behavior, because our, our lower triangular behavior because uh, this guy is, or sorry, upper. It's very close to being upper triangular because we've now got this uh, guy here. I'm going to wipe out what's under it, so we're going to do um, minus 3 of that to that, giving us um, 1, 0, 1, minus 1. Nothing changes the first row or the second row or the third row. But the, th the final row is minus 3 of that to that, minus 3 of that to that, so 0, 0, 0, and if I've got it right, it's something like 56, I guess. Is that right? So it um, should be minus 3, so 3 sixteens, 48, minus 3 of that. So if that's 48 uh, added to 8, it should be 56. Okay, so that gives us um, the, the story, and now what we've done is go, gone through various steps and produced 
this guy is upper. So this will be our upper triangular description. So we start with the matrix A, and we've gone down step by step by step by step and produced a, a, an upper triangular matrix U. Now the steps themselves produce the lower triangular part because the lower triangular part should come out of the steps we used here. And each step was pretty simple. It involved we could start with the identity matrix and then we could add multiples of rows to lower rows in this way. Um, so, uh, so that's how we'd construct the matrix that does the process that we want done. Um, now, of course, the tricky thing is we really don't want, we really want to write A as L, U, and we found that the L we need is actually the inverse of what we get from each of these operations. So if we carry out the inverse operations, we should be fine. Um, each operation is just pushing uh, numbers down further. It's just adding multiples of rows to lower rows. So its inverse is given by adding those multiples of those rows to those lower rows. And so if we just add those multiples, we'll get the right result. Instead of uh, being 1, 5, minus 2, I want it to be minus 1, minus 5, 2. So it's going to be um, a minus 1, minus 5, 2. And then this guy was minus 4 of this to this and uh, 2 of this to this. So it has to be plus 4 uh, and, um, and minus 2 um, so that it reverses this process here. And then this guy was minus 3 of that to that. So it has to be plus 3 of that to that we carried out on the identity matrix. And this, so what we've done now is to take the identity matrix and apply these reverse the reversed operations to it. Uh, so that we get the lower triangular matrix. And then otherwise it should be an unchanged identity matrix, so all the other entries should look just like the entries in the identity matrix. And that should give us the final result, so that's L. So L is what you get by doing the reverses, op reversing signed operations. Take, take the uh, signs and change them on all these things and then carry that out on the identity matrix, which you can do by eye pretty much. I didn't actually need to write all these steps here because the identity matrix is so simple. It's easy to carry out these operations on the identity just by eye. You add these appropriate multiples of rows to lower rows, but with the signs changed. So you take the identity matrix and add multiples of the rows to lower rows with the signs changed from these signs to produce L. Finally, we've got A is L, U, where we've got the L here, this is the L, and this is the U. And so we've written A as an, in an L, U decomposition. So why is this so useful? What's the point of it? Um, we wanted to solve A, X equals B, but we know that A is L, U, so we get L, U, X is B. And so what we want to do then is to first solve one system and then solve the other. So what we're going to do is write that as two systems, L, U, Y equals B, and uh, U, um, so, so Y is going to be U, uh, U, X, and so uh, U, X equals Y. So if I write this one system as these two systems, that may seem like a bad, oh, sorry, that's, uh, let's move that up a bit. Okay, that may seem like a bad idea. I've taken AX equals B, written that A has an LU decomposition, and then I can say, well, if I treat UX as the unknown instead of X, then I write that as an unknown Y, solve that system, and then plug the Y in here and solve that system, and that should give me the value of X. Uh, again, if I, if I take these equations, plug in this for Y into here, I get LUX equals B, but LU is A, so that gives me back the system I started with. So you can see that these have the same solutions, X. And so all we have to do is use uh, these equations instead of this one. But why is it better to have two instead of one? Two equations are somehow better than one, because this is lower and this is upper. And so it turns out to be much faster to solve them. You can solve these very, very quickly, um, because you, you have a much simpler structure. Let's, let's see why. Well, what does this look like when you spell it out? Let's spell out those equations completely. We, had, um, uh, we want to solve Ly equals b, and we also want to solve ux equals y. We'll have to do this one first because we don't know what y is. Then we'll plug the y in here and do this one. Now L, we worked out, was a matrix 1 minus 1 minus 5, 2, 0, 1, 4, minus 2, 0, 0, 1, 3, 0, 0, 0, 1. And we want to solve that that should, thing should be equal to B. And the vector B that we decided we were going to work with was 0, 1, minus 2, 2. 
So that's the linear system you're going to work with. You compute out from here. And you can do this one very, very quickly because it's a very simple situation of applying um, the appropriate row operations which invert this, this story. In fact, exactly the row operations we had before on A. So we can invert this by step by step by adding one of that to that, five of that to that, minus two of that to that, so on and so forth. We can compute out the, the inverse. I won't do it, but you get um, when you go through all the um, the Gaussian elimination steps that produce the row echelon form, you'll get to, uh, apparently, you'll get to something that looks like uh, 0, uh, 1, minus 6, and 22. So that's how we would solve this first step. And then we plug that in, so this must be y, because y is the unknown in this problem. Then we plug that into this guy here, the, un the unknown y now becomes known and put, gets put into this system. And u was the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, uh, 1, 1, 1, 0, minus 1, 3, minus 16, and 56. I have to put that in for u. So that's now the known upper triangular u. We've got this y, which we've worked out from here. 20, is it 22? Uh, that should be, okay. So that's 22. Okay, so then we plug that in. And then what we have to do is add multiples of rows to higher rows. We'll add the suitable multiple of this row to the higher rows to knock those out above the pivot. And to have to rescale this and then suitably knock those out. And we go through the process, and we end up with one zero 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 one zero 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 one zero 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 one identity matrix. And then finally, we end up with some unbelievably ugly expression. But anyway, it does work out to be the problem is this fifty six. You have to divide by, it, and that makes the coefficients become quite ugly. Minus thirteen, minus thirteen over uh, twenty eight. And uh, finally, 3 over 28. So it does make it possible. It's not very pretty, but it's possible to calculate the solution to the problem. Now, um, this isn't really a great uh, step forward for us over the, the original uh, manipulations that we had before from row echelon form. We could have just done this using just directly starting with the original matrix. Um, we we started so if we remember I started with the original problem what we've, what we've now that we've now solved was that we had this matrix um, it doesn't matter terribly much what it had in it but let's just remember that it was this matrix and we had a vector b um, we had this this matrix a this vector b and what we've done is to figure out how to solve ax equals b. Um, that's the unknown x that we solve for. And this is its solution here. This is the x, this, this vector x. It's un difficult to read. Sorry about the handwriting. But it's, uh, it's sitting there. Now, this doesn't seem like much of, a, of an advantage. As I said before, what we could do is just write down a and then a, a, a big column of b and make it an augmented matrix and just do row echelon form. If we did that, we would, in one row echelon form step, we would come up with the answer x. Here we've split it into parts. We first worked out what was what was u, and, and then what was l, and then we've done this with l, and then we've done this with u. So it's a much more complicated story, but um, if you change b, you don't have to recalculate. And the point is that this is fast, and this is fast, and then if you change b, so that's why this matters. It doesn't say that in the notes, but perhaps it should. Uh, if you change B, um, L and U are the same. Then, uh, then if you change B, then L and U are the same. So you can use the same L and the same U. So if you have a new B, um, you don't have to change the. You don't have to recompute the L and the U. Um, so that means that these steps actually, if you keep changing this b, these coefficients here, that's b written down there, you do this step, then you plug it in, then you do this step, it's actually not that bad. It's very quick.
So this is a useful technique, the LU decomposition. When you want to solve AX equals B, but you have 15 or 29 or 1,000 different Bs, or you don't know what B is going to be ahead of time, um, but you know what A is. So if you know the A and you don't know the B, and the B keeps changing and changing and changing, then you have to solve lots and lots of linear algebra problems with different Bs, the same A. Then it makes sense to just work out the L and the U for that A. You compute out the L for that A, you compute out the U for that A, and then you have these linear equations, which are easier and faster to work with. They rapidly calculate out for you what is the what are what is the answer for a given b, and then if you change the b, they are just as fast to do over again with the same l, the same u. So in the previous lecture, we talked about inverses, and we said that one of the um, simple tricks we have for working with the inverse uh, for two by twos is that we know how to use this adjugate, and we know how to use the determinant. So we need to have a determinant for higher dimensional matrices. But we've also pointed out that for higher dimensional matrices, it may be very difficult to find the determinant. In practice, it's not very computationally feasible for large matrices. Still, it's worth having even if it's not feasible because it often has a, has a theoretical value that can help us to see how to solve linear algebra problems even when we can't do the calculations. So it's got a more theoretical focus, but often that theory can be very practical.